Hello and welcome to the Divine Renovation Podcast, where we seek to inspire and equip you to move your parish for maintenance mission. My name's Dan O'Rourke. I have Father James Mallon on set, and I got Ron Huntley on set. And uh, look, we're going to start off with an apology. Sometimes on these podcasts, you occasionally get some some radio interference. You might hear some talk radio, maybe some country. I'm not sure. We pick up some radio interference on this on this podcast sometimes. It's the top of the street here from where our studio is. There's these big, huge radio towers. Huge somewhere. radio towers. Yeah. Massive broadcasting radio towers. Like. 50 paces and in that direction. poor Paul has to manage it while we try to record and do our production. And there's <laughs> lots of cables. The cables are good conductors. You know, I, when I first learned this, I was a young priest. It was 1997, 1998. I was at St. Mary's Cathedral. And the building is very old. And the wiring there is probably from the 1950s in some places. Right. And I, I remember it was the evening mass. It was a Sunday night mass. I'm praying mass. And it's like, is that country western music? <laughs> I, I swear I can hear country western music and I'm looking out and people, other people are going, I was like, do you hear that? And, and what it was, was the local radio tower signals were being picked up by the wiring, the old wiring. It didn't have good in, insulation. Insulation was poor. So it was, and it could be talk radio. It could be country western. During mass. During mass. I remember one, I remember one point. So it comes through the speakers. Yes. We were praying the Our Father and we and I asked, we said, we got to speak loudly so we can drown out the country western music. It was that bad. It was that bad. Yeah. That's it lasted for several weeks. I'm not sure like, it was weird. Like after that, it never happened again, but right. just whatever was happening in the atmosphere. But yeah, competing with country western music during mass, it was very, very traumatic. <laughs> I bet it would be. You know, it reminds me when we were at the LA Congress a number, a couple of years ago, and I remember that. Oh, yeah. and, you know, <laughs> that was just last year. A year, year and a half ago. Last yeah. year? Oh my gosh, that's hilarious. But it was so funny, Dan, because here, you know, Father James, in terms of uh, production and quality, you know, he has a real eye and good ear for that. Oh, and, he does. Which is, right? He and really he's does. He's super attentive to yeah, it. he's super, super attentive to it. And so here we are ready to kick off this conference. We have 300 people in the room, and there's it's a huge conference. So the, every room in this great big conference center is being used. And all of a sudden, Father James starts talking and you hear somebody else just as loud as him. Yes. Speaking it wasn't just in interference. a it was, different language. Yeah, in Spanish. Yeah, his feed was literally coming into our room. Guess what? It lasted for 40 minutes. Wow. <laughs> we, we flagged it. The people went off to try to fix it. We postponed, postponed, and it was like... Well, I think 15 minutes was gone, and I said to him, "We've because we had uh, it was a three session through, throughout the whole day, and yeah, so we've got, we've got to start." And so we just started talking, and we and it was so hard to <laughs> present with this not just country western music, but just this equally loud volume and a, and a different language. And then the worst thing happened. The the harp mu started playing harp music, so there's this harp music being played. I don't know what the heck they were doing in the other room. So I'm giving my talk with a musical background. So I started singing my presentation <laughs> and dancing. Like I started dancing. It was so silly. Oh, and then, God bless and then you. it finally stopped. But it really was. Oh, it was so. It was very difficult. Well, yes. hopefully it doesn't get quite that complicated for the yeah, podcast here. So. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the reality is we don't get to hear the noise. I know it gets picked up on the gear, but yeah. it, it's a great metaphor for life. It's a great metaphor for parish renewal. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that. Well, the, the task of, of leading your parish from maintenance to mission, there's a lot of interference sometimes. It's sometimes it's country music. Sometimes it's it's uh, harp music. Sometimes it's other voices speaking a different message. In a different language. In a different <laughs> language. And, and you've got to somehow be able to sort through the, the the voices and the different demands that are on you. So the same kind of mental energy to, to keep focused, to, to keep to the point is sometimes required in, in living out in a parish that cultivate for maintenance mission because it, it doesn't just happen by itself. See, how's that for apply? I heard what, I quite a metaphor there. I think, you know, when, next time we do a big event, we're going to make sure that we broadcast <laughs> in some, some Spanish over top of your mic just to see if you can roll with it still. Well, if I could take that another step further too, John Ray, one of our parishioners last night, sent me an image and on it it said, a silent mind can hear intuition over fear. Right? And so with all the noise, can we silence ourselves? And that's why prayer is so important. Mm. That's why meditating over scripture is so important because it centers us. And then we, our to it, intuition, our cooperation with the Holy Spirit can rise up and we can block out the noise that actually makes us afraid. 
Yeah. 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 Well, some of the things that we, I know we keep experiencing, keep hearing is that parishes are, are, are embracing divine renovation. They're embracing some of the principles but others are still a little bit reluctant. Have you had any conversations lately that, that sort of blend that, the, the reluctance, the, yeah, this, uh, you know, my, some of the listeners or viewers may know that I have two jobs. I work for the diocese on the one hand, helping our diocese with, with renewal, with working with the bishop and, and working with some of our pastors who are open to it. And, and then the other hand, I'm working with Divine Renovation, which really is dealing with people coming to us. Whereas my other job with the priests is me going to them. Uh, There's a very different dynamic. It's a very <laughs> different so, dynamic. As, as, as our local church kind of grapples with, with this, there's been a, a key question and a, a bit of a breakthrough I've had with a couple of priests this week in my, my own diocese. And it's the realization is, oh, okay, so... This isn't about us becoming St. Benedict Parish. It's not about us copying everything that St. Benedict Parish does. And it's like, no, it's, it's in fact, please don't, don't just copy best practices mm -hmm. uh, for two reasons. Because if you copy what we do without understanding why we do it, it's not going to bear the fruit. It's not going to have a context. Yeah. And, and on, on the other hand, you know, it, it's not going to go deep enough, you know? So, so, um, for them, it was a it was a real breakthrough to, to, for be able to to be able to say to them, what matters is that you understand why you understand the principle, the value underneath it, and take that value into your parish and ask the question, how do we best live that value in this place with this particular group of people? And I'm not kidding you. When we were able to cross that bridge with several of our priests, it was like, oh, now I get it. Now, and you can tell they were beginning to get excited about it. I think I've, I've personally become more and more convicted that this is actually one of the key things that's working so well in the coaching side of things, because I think a lot of people are inclined to just do the copy and paste, right? Like, oh, I read that, that you know, this is what they do at St. Benedict, or I, I went to a conference and I heard Father James say, this is what we do at St. Benedict, so we started doing it at our parish. And, and they're seeing sometimes, they are seeing yeah. some fruit from it. It's not that it doesn't work. It's just that they're not getting to the, the level that they expect or hope. Yeah. And I think that's some of the insights that you and the coaching team really provide, right, Ron? Well, that's fun. We've had some... Many people, we've had six applications recently, and so we're onboarding them. Part of that is an interview process to make sure it's a good fit. And two of them that are uh, coming into the network right now have been applying what we do, best practices in their church with divine renovation. And they're looking forward to the network because although they're applying these best practices, they're not as connected as they'd like them to be. And that gets back to the why. Mm -hmm. And so we'll be able to help them with that. And that's going to create exponential impact yeah. in their churches. So I'm really excited to, to work through that with people. Um, yeah, yeah, so it is. And it's not that a person couldn't do it on their own. It's just, it's no. not always as intuitive, right? They, they can see that, you know, uh, prayer partners is the one I've heard a few examples of par mm. uh, parishes that aren't in our network that are, are doing the prayer partner thing. And they're, they're seeing some some fruit from it. But they're, they're not, if they don't embrace the, the underlying principle, then it, it kind of begins and stops there, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, I remember too, it was, Actually, Father Simon about two years ago said this to me when he was when he first arrived at the parish to do his in internship, and he said, "You know, I'm really seeing that that whatever divine renovation is, it, it essentially is a proposal that a set of live values. If you actually live these values and not just have them as aspirational values, things that right. we say we want to value, but we actually live it, it will create health, mm. and healthy things grow and bear fruit. Right? Simple as that, because." The vine dresser is 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 faithful. Uh, the the seed is is potent and as powerful as ever. There's nothing wrong with the seed, uh, and yet it, if we allow this, if we can help bring this thing to a place of health, fruit will come. Mm -hmm. Health will come. Growth will come. And that's the soil, isn't it? So you know, I often say a great vision um, attracts with a great vision with great leadership attracts great people. That's right. so let me ask you a question, Ron. As you and the others on the on the coaching team, as you work with parishes in the Divine Renovation Network, are they starting to look the same? Are they becoming uh, more similar or, or, or are they still retaining? Into, like, help me understand what it looks like. Well, That's I think we're works. celebrating similar wins. We're selling, like, you know, there's a difference between making and forming disciples. And I think the church is really focused well on forming disciples, not so much on making disciples. So we're forming people who aren't disciples yet and it's not working. And so worldwide we're getting, we're recognizing that. And so I think we're getting, like Divine Renovation is helping people begin to make disciples and to value it because cultures change by what you reward and what you tolerate. So sometimes they implement alpha, let's say, but they don't tell the stories. 
They don't reward the people and acknowledge the people that are working so hard behind the scene. But that's leadership. And so we're helping connect these things. So we're, we're, we're starting to celebrate the same things. We're starting to speak some of the similar languages. Now, it, it looks different. Like some, I know one church, is, they have five alphas going on at the same time. They're smaller alphas, but that's their approach. They're raising up a lot of leaders. It's mm-hmm. fine. Nothing wrong with that. There's, so there's lots of different ways to live out those principles, that, but we're celebrating the same thing in terms of change lives. People are encountering Christ in a transformational way, and they're opening up their lives to the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's happening throughout the network. Ron, you used the word reward. So just, I mean, that's, again, that, that quote, you know, culture is shaped by what you reward and what you tolerate and such. Mm-hmm. Uh, so tell us what, you, what that might concretely look like. Because when we hear the word reward, some people might say, well, I don't, yeah, I don't do this. I don't do this for a reward. Mm. You know, I don't Fair do enough. this. I'm, I'm, I'm completely 100% pure in my motives, unlike <laughs> other people, I guess. <laughs> well, and, and sure, there's people like that. And, and yet you say, hey, I noticed how you welcomed that person when they came in today. And that person was really uncomfortable. Thanks for going out of your way to do that. Now, that person might not have needed that, but it doesn't mean that doesn't fill their tank. doesn't mean they don't appreciate being noticed. Catch people doing the very things that you want to see happening again and again and tell others. Yeah. You know, catch people being invitational. Catch people being hospitable. Catch people going out of their way to do nice things on staff or what have you and tell others about it because it really does create a momentum. And because I think it's, a, and it, I love your point, Father James, because you know, we shouldn't have to do that. Well, it's because we shouldn't have to doesn't mean it's not helpful. Remember when you ran, um, when you were leading Alpha and all the different teams run about once every every run of Alpha, I would get, I'd, I'd get up in the morning and find about 40 emails in my <laughs> inbox. And it was really beautiful because Ron would actually send a, a, a thank you email and a, a very beautifully personalized, affirming email to a person of the, on his team, a key person, and he'd copy me in and he'd visibly copy me in. Um, and I forget how it No, did, let me tell you, me. let me tell you what yeah, I you do. tell me what you did. I would write it to you. That's so if it right. was Dan, I would say, Father James, I just want you to know how hard Dan works behind the scenes for Alpha. He's been so much fun, so helpful to people around him, and we're so blessed to have him in our church, and I just wanted you to know. So my letter would be to you, but I would copy him. That's right. That's what you mm. did. It was beautiful. It was powerful. Yeah, yeah. and then and it was then great. oftentimes I would reach out to yeah. people my, myself. That's right. You'd send a note saying, Dan, so thankful. So it, was, it could be a shorter note for you. Yeah. But for him to get to see, I'm telling him, I'm telling you about him, for him you to know, see that. Well, in all my years, <laughs> so I, confusing. I, I've, never, I've never seen anything like that done before. Right. I just never experienced that. And it mm-hmm. was an amazing gift that, that you brought. And that was a great way to, to celebrate that kind of faithful service. All right, I'd like, let's cut it off right there because I would love to celebrate someone. I know we've got Mark Saldana, who's a parishioner at St. Benedict Parish, who, who launched a ministry. So I'd love to bring him in, have him tell a little bit of his personal story, and we could celebrate what he's done by launching his ministry. So we'll be right back. you ever read books or listened to talks on parish renewal and leadership and thought, that's good for them, <laughs> but how would that ever happen in my parish? And do these people even know what it's like to be in a parish? How do you bridge the gap between the theory and real life parish? The Divine Renovation Association exists for all those reasons. It's created for and by people who have lived it and are living it right now in real life parishes. I believe that every parish potential to impact the world around it. I believe that every leader has the capacity to be a better leader. I believe that every parish can be so much better and more exciting than it currently is. And we want to help with that, to help you and your team to move your parish from maintenance to mission. Welcome back. And we've got Mark Saldana on set now. Mark, it is so good of you to come on. on, on the, the, the. It's not bad right there. <laughs> <laughs> With my hands. <laughs> they did not move. That's impressive. <laughs> They're like glued. Alright, try again. Yeah. 
<laughs> welcome back, Mark. Welcome to the podcast. You, it's so great you. to have you on set, man. Good to be here. Thank you. So, Mark, you've been a, a longtime parishioner at St. Benedict Parish. Yeah. Uh, and and I, there's, a, there's a number of elements of your story that I'm interested in, but why don't you tell us, how, how has St. Benedict Parish, how has it impacted your life? Yeah, like, so ever since those three parishes, they came together, you know, I wasn't very, wasn't really sold on the whole idea of my faith. Um, <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't a big deal to me. Uh, but as soon as I came to St. Banks, I still remember our opening mass. I was, I was altar server and there were like 30 other altar servers and there were so many people. And just like after those weeks, I realized, you know, this is, this is like a home already. You know, people want me to be here and it's a place where I can grow um, and really like live out my potential and really like, get to know the living God. And so that was, that was huge for me. How old were you at the time? I think I was around 13. 13. Yeah. Yeah. So Father James, you would have been pastor. When did you get to know Mark? Well, I arrived a couple of months after that first mass. Right. So of course at that point, everything was a blur. There was all these people I was, I was getting yeah. to know, but Mark was yeah. an altar server and he was considerably shorter than me. I just wanted to <laughs> <stuff like that. laughs> At that time he was so he's like he was this little kid. And and now I've I've grown to know this amazing young man and yeah. it's just been such an honor to see you not just grow physically yeah. uh, but to see you grow spiritually and to take your place in yeah. within our church. Yeah. So you got to experience St. Benedict Parish as it sort of went through its journey to become yeah. a missional parish. What were some of the things that you experienced? Right. At first at first I didn't really realize what was happening. Like I, I had no clue, but I, I still remember. I think you you read Father James uh, a letter uh, during one of your homilies. It's like all I think you read it you read it later later actually, and it was like all the changes you wanted to see. And I remember it was like uh, you know have this many people in ministry, like have the Canadian Tire parking lot, like all all, all <laughs> these different things, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I I know you read it again later on, and we had seen how many things have really come to, how many things have happened, and now and I just at that moment I realized things are happening here things are changing for sure and that, that was a big eye-opener for me yeah mm. cool yeah. so uh, mark I, like what about you personally like so mm. you were caught up in it you were seeing things are going on you were young you felt at home but were there any moments were there any experiences in terms of steubenville i know part yeah. of your story of share, share with us you know what points did you go deeper in yeah your spiritual life yeah so you know in like my other churches that I've been a part of in youth group, um, it, there were great programs, but what I, the, the biggest difference for me at St. Benedict's is that people really cared about me and they wanted to keep it real with me. They didn't want me to just be lukewarm in my faith. And so I think, like, I, I think the biggest moment uh, that I still remember today was I, was I was just at a coffee social. I was uh, just minding my own business, eating my lemon cake, you know, drinking some apple juice. And then I see Ron Huntley at the, end, at the other end of the, of the room. And I see him like, he's starting to walk over to me. And um, I was like, I, I got a little scared, but I was like, yeah. I, I quickly took another sip of apple juice and I was, I was, I was ready. And <laughs> exactly, exactly. And this was, this was actually uh, sort of right before I went to university. And I remember at this moment, like Ron, I, I thought he was just gonna say, hey, how's it going? You know, one of those. But he came up to me right away and he said, what is stopping you from being a man in your faith? And I was like, well, that's quite an opener, right? Yeah. There. <laughs> I was like, hey, Ron. <laughs> yeah. And the weirdest thing is I didn't have an answer. Like I had no clue. And I thought about it later and I said, I don't have a reason. Like I'm, I'm sort of just being lazy in my faith. I'm, I'm not really taking an active role. And you, you really, you wanted me to, to go to Franciscan lead. You know, oh, Christian, your man. son had done yes. it. Um, and so like you, Christian and Nick Pinto, uh, the three of you, uh, because of that moment, because you wanted to keep it real with me and you, you noticed something was different to me. That's why I, I decided to do Franciscan lead. And that's what really changed my life going to university. Can you share with those listening, watching, what is Franciscan lead and what, and what is right. Steubenville? So that some right. people will know what that is, but uh, for others yeah. they might not. Yeah, so the Steubenville, it's, it's, it's a conference. It's once a year in the summer. Uh, it's for a high school youth. And uh, around seven, 800 people get together uh, for two or three days in the summer. And there are lots of great talks, uh, great music. You meet a lot of people and it's, uh, it's a great way to, to, to grow in your faith. But right after that, something a bit more intense was Franciscan lead. And that's a one week, it's like a formation program uh, for people in high school. And so that was always a big deal to me. I never thought I'd do it, but 
I ended up doing it. it was, and, and that's yeah. named after the Franciscan University of Steubenville in Ohio. So Steubenville, exactly. for some people, like isn't that like a small mining town in Ohio? Yes, it is. But there's also <laughs> this Catholic University, which in the 70s and 80s became a great center for renewal within the church. And they developed yeah. these amazing youth conferences, which they then exported around North America. Right. And we have one every year. Exactly. In so we, locals call it Steubenville, yeah. even though that's a small town in in uh, in, in Ohio. But, yeah. but it's... Uh, it's synonymous with a, a, an amazing experience mm. uh, of a conference in, at which many young people come, come into an encounter with, with the Lord. Yeah. So, Mark, Steubenville and Lee clearly made a big difference in your life, but was there a moment during those experiences that mm. things began to change? Yeah, so this was right after my, my grade 12, uh, like last year before university. And you know, in high school, it, it was kind of hard because I was I was one of the only ones who, who kind of had this faith, and it, it was very hard to grow and mature in it. And and so during this uh, during lead, um, I remember there's a prayer session. Uh, my friend Nick Pinto, he was praying over me, and uh, he said a prayer that I'll never forget. He said, "I pray that Mark." not only grows in his faith this weekend, but he continues to do it as he goes off to university and for the rest of his life, right? And that's like the most I could have ever asked for. And uh, that's something that it, it hit me. It was like, there, I looked around, there were 30 other people in the room that were my age who, who wanted to live out this faith. And I realized like I, I wasn't alone in this. Mm -hmm. And it, it was such a beautiful moment. And that really like, it, it kickstarted a lot for me. Yeah. And that kick starts taking you a long way. I know in the last couple of years, you've been on, on quite a journey. Right. In fact, you've actually launched a ministry called Greater Love. Why don't you tell us a little bit about it, Mark? Yeah, for sure. So I think uh, almost last year, I think we were, we were all at the London, the leadership conference. And I, I still remember I, w I was seeing all these people going on stage, some young people too, and they were all doing incredible things for God. And they were serving, serving God. And I kept saying to myself, God, why aren't you asking me to do something amazing? Like all, like, That's like all cool. these people, right? What a cool question. Yeah, and, <laughs> and I had realized at that moment that I'd always been asking God, like, God, how do you want me to serve you? What do you want me to do for you? But I'd never stick around to actually hear his answer. Right? <laughs> I, 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 I get out of there, right? And, and I noticed that that wasn't total surrender. That's not what full surrender is. And so uh, there, it was during a Holy Spirit session uh, after listening to Jean Vanier's talk, mm -hmm. which is very inspiring. And uh, so, yeah, during that Holy Spirit session, I, I decided to give it all to God, completely surrender. And in that very moment, I, I pictured Jesus in his last week of life. And in his last week of life, he was homeless. He, he was poor. Um, he went without food. He was sick. He was imprisoned, right? And I realized that Jesus is most present in these people and these vulnerable people who we so often overlook, who we push to the side because I, I really do think we live in a throwaway culture, right? If something's uh, no use to us, if it's inconvenient, we push it, them off to the side. And um, yeah, so it was at that, I think that was the, the turning point for me. I realized there are people who need our help and they're often overlooked. So what can I do about that? And so you, yeah. you launched something called Greater Love. Yeah. So what does Greater Love do? Right, so Greater Love, so many, so many youth in Nova Scotia, for example, you know, we like they really do have a heart for others. They are very mm -hmm. compassionate people yeah. and they want to help others. Yeah. But personally, from my experience, the most I could do is go in a hospital and like deliver, deliver charts or be in a food bank and um, sort cans, all two great things. Yeah. But it's not, you don't really get to work with people. You don't get to spend time with people, get to know them. So I said, you know, there are people who want to do it and there's a need for it. So why, why don't we create an organization that, that kind of bridges that gap? And um, yeah, so our goal is to really reach out to these vulnerable, these marginalized people, um, uh, show them that we, that we love them, that we, the, that we care for them. And uh, like, yeah, do whatever we can. How do you them. do it? So yeah. practically speaking, what right. do you do? Yeah. So every, every weekend we'll get together. Uh, it's about 15 people every week. And in total, we have around like 100 volunteers who come out. And uh, so we get together as a group. We have lots of food donated by St. Benedict parishioners and like uh, 
um, quite, quite a few other people in our community. And we'll, so we'll get together, we'll get into groups of two or three, and we'll usually we'll go to Spring Garden Road, so a very common downtown busy road street, here, yeah. very busy street. And that's where most of our homeless or poor people are. And so what we'll do is we'll, we'll walk down the street and we'll approach these people, say, hi, how's it going? How's your day? How's your day been so far? And usually we open it up by just offering the food. It's a great way to start conversation. Um, and after that, you know, we j if they're sitting down, we sit down with them. We don't want to appear as like, we don't want to be standing while they're sitting, right? We want to like get on their level and really just be there as a friend for them. Mm -hmm. And we just talk to them and listen, mainly listen to them, uh, like a lot of their life stories, what they've been going through. Really? And so they'll yeah. tell you that, they'll share that with you about exactly. their sandwich. Yeah, they're very, they're so open to sharing those things. And it's amazing because over, over this time, we've, we've gained such, uh, we built such strong relationships with these people. People. Stop it. Yeah, yeah. That's so cool. it's so cool. Like, we'll be walking down Spring Garden, like, totally unrelated, <laughs> and we'll see one of our friends and we'll be like, hey, how's it going? And, like, th they'll wave back and say, how's your day been? And, like, people are looking at us, like, what are you guys, like, why are you talking? And why are you talking yeah. to them? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That is incredible. Do you guys make the sandwiches? Are they made when you get them, or how does that work? Yeah, so... <laughs> one day you know i just opened my front door and there's like cans of tuna just standing there sit sitting there i was like how do you know where i live first of all but like <laughs> all, all these parishioners they they're every time i go to church there's like if they can't come out to volunteer they say how else can we help you and they'll always like donate food, lots of different uh lots of kinds of food like coffee cards or or just money and it's mm -hmm. it's unbelievable you know what i remember when, when i first heard about what you had done mark and it struck me it, you know, i think i was still pastor at that point when you started this yeah. but I had absolutely nothing to do with it like I didn't even know you were doing it <laughs> yeah. and when I found out that you had basically launched this initiative and led it and, and and it was happening and and I didn't even know about it I thought that was absolutely fantastic <laughs> yeah. that was, I mean yeah. that was absolutely fantastic because you don't need my permission to to go and live your faith right and yeah you took initiative and you led it and you were living your baptismal calling in yeah. such a beautiful way and I was Man, I was uh, I was proud of you. Yeah, yeah. me yeah. too. Mark, like those people you say have about a hundred people on your volunteer mm -hmm. list. My guess is they're not a hundred churchgoers; they're just a mm -hmm. hundred. So tell me a little bit about exactly. that. Like, who's been drawn to this ministry, and what's that been like? Yeah, so I was so I was so happy to find out that it wasn't just people from St. Benedict's who wanted to come. It was people from Dalhousie, St. Mary's, yeah. our, our local universities. Uh, all so many of these people. You know, as soon as they hear. Oh, young students going out to help these people like sign us up where can we sign up and uh, it's, it's really it's starting to grow as well which is amazing like students from a like there I know some students like in different universities around Canada and they're all saying like Mark we'd love to bring greater love to our university and you like see? yeah it's it's, 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 it's crazy so it's like great. yeah I'm like yeah like let me know what I can do to help you but they're just they're sold on the idea already like so that just shows me that like people want to do this. Mm -hmm. um, it's something that they've, they've all been waiting to do, but they've just mm -hmm. been waiting for the chance. And do you know what it shows me too, Mark, is that here you were convicted, you know, all the way in the UK, and mo inspired by Jean Vanier's talk. That's why it's so important for us to tell our stories. Here he is mm -hmm. telling his story. Yeah. Inspires you. And what do you do? You fully surrender your life mm -hmm. to God. And what's he do? He talks to you. Yeah. He reminds you, he helps you see that, yeah, I've been trying to talk to you, Mark. You ask the question, you walk away. He convicts you of that in your heart. And then he gives you a new vision. Exactly. And he uses your gifts. And by you just being you, you're inspiring other people all across Canada to maybe do the same thing. That's what God wants to do with each of us, isn't it? And that's our hope at mm -hmm. St. Benedict is we just want you to be you and, and yeah. know who you're so When who we you talk are. about, when you say we want to raise up, see, an army of missionary disciples. Mm. You know, be, disciples, people who have come into relationship with the Lord, who have made a decision to follow Him and then see their life as a mission field, who are willing to not just ask, what do you want me to do, but willing to stick around and hear the, and hear the answer and then begin yeah. to live the answer. Yeah. You know, there's some, there's some people too, like I heard uh, you have a friend named Ray that's involved in other things, but he heard what you were. Tell us a little bit exactly, about that. Yeah, the, the support from just the, the whole community has been, has been unbelievable. Uh, so Ray on Jewel, um, uh, so he's, he's at, he, he works uh, with one of the, our local MLAs, him and yeah. yeah, yeah, and him and Rafa, who's another one. They've they've just been so helpful. You know, they 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 love spreading the word about what's happening. Really trying to mobilize, get other people involved. Um, 
and they've just been there like to support so much and i'm so grateful for that right because it's not only our parishioners but it's it's everyone everyone should be reaching out and trying to help these people mm-hmm. and so that they've just been such a big help uh, <laughs> it's, it's so crazy. much fun yeah. you know there's so many you know, christians you know we're christian follow christ and it's really important to us it's primary but we don't hold you know the keys to good works and and love and generosity to other people like it's it's work god made us all that way yeah whether we know jesus yet or not my guess is people know that they want to help people that are less fortunate you can't help but want to make a difference in this world yeah and and that's god calls us we're made for greatness i heard one time jesus didn't come to take away our suffering he came to make us great. And your story just really reminds me of how we can continue to further surrender. There's always little touch points in our life that can be important, can be transformational, whether it's me giving you a very bold, uncomfortable question (laughs) or or whether it's something silent in prayer, but God's always drawing us to be great and to love and serve others. I'm just so inspired by what you're doing. Mark, what I love yeah. about your story, and because uh, I, I know Jean Vanier inspired you, and he's, he's got to be one of your heroes. Yeah. And I think one of Jean Vanier's great gifts is that he sees the humanity in people. Right. And what I hear in greater love isn't just that you're serving a need, but you're serving a person. Mm. You're sitting down with the person, and I think there's such a beauty in that, and it shows such a beauty in your heart. And I'm just so grateful for the ministry. I'm so grateful for you. If other people want to learn more about greater love, whether they're local or whether they're abroad what's the best way for them to find you right so yeah we we're on facebook or instagram and like i think our website is coming out soon as well uh because yeah we just became like a non-profit organization as well so yeah we're we're always looking out for people to join so that's yeah. awesome love yeah. that and if people want to donate then if you're a non-profit you're able to donate now yes and you can receive donations exactly, that's, that's yeah. wonderful mark thanks yeah. so much for being with us Thank today you. yeah and for everyone who is joining us if you want more information on on uh on mark's charity the uh, greater love we'll we'll, keep, we'll put the link in the show notes and for information on divine renovation you can check out divinerenovation.net or download our app and we'll see you next time next time god bless <laughs>